Please open your Bibles with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. In our study together this evening, we are going to be looking at verse 6 of that text. But in order to see the entire context, I want to begin the reading in verse 6 and continue down through verse 15 of the chapter. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 will begin in verse 6, but before we read God's word, let's bow together. Gracious God and Father in heaven, we do thank you once again for the opportunity and privilege of hearing your word. We pray, O God, that your spirit would bless us as we gather to do so. O Lord, we pray that you would help us, that you would give us insight into the scripture that we will examine today, that your spirit would teach us, O Lord, the things that we must believe and the things that we ought to do. We pray, O God, that you would guide us and help us in this endeavor. Forgive our sins, cleanse our conscience by the work of Christ, and comfort our hearts by the promises of the gospel. We pray, O Father, that you would sanctify us and strengthen us through the instruction of your word, and that you would be honored and glorified in this and in all things. In Jesus, our Savior's name, amen. Hear now the word of God, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning at verse 6. This is God's holy inspired and inerrant word. But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you, Not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Now those who are such, we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread." But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. And if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person, and do not keep company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. The grass withers, the flower fades, the word of our God stands forever. Look again with me at verse 6. This will be the text that we focus upon. We command you, brethren... In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. It's regrettable that we ever have to speak about or practice church discipline, but it is also important and necessary that we both speak about it and practice it from time to time. The subject of church discipline is not something most of us enjoy thinking about, much less talking about. And if we do enjoy it, then it might be a clear indicator that we have the wrong attitude with regard to it. But the reality is that the visible church is made up of sinners. That is the only kind of church member that there is in any congregation of the Lord's people. And since we all do sin, there will periodically and inevitably be occasions for discipline. Now, several years ago, in 2017, we devoted three lessons uh, to this theme in in a short series over the course of several months. And since there were multiple lessons in that series, those sermons include far more information than we will have time to cover today. But our congregation has changed quite a bit in the last three years. Some of our members have moved on, uh, other members have joined And we hope that all of us have grown and are better able today to understand these kind of issues when we once again study them. And besides those changes, we are a forgetful people. We know that we have to be reminded of the truths that we know and cherish. And from time to time, we need to revisit and reinforce these kinds of lessons. And so the elders felt this was an appropriate time to revisit the subject of church discipline and speak to scriptures teaching on it. There are a number of passages in the Bible that speak about discipline in the church. We have a number of Old Testament texts that are precursors of its application in a new covenant community. 
But in the New Testament, we have several passages that speak very directly to the issue. Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 to 17. The entirety of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Romans chapter 16, verses 17 and 18. And Titus chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. Even in the verses that we just read, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6, and verses 14 and 15, all directly speak to this matter. But today I want to emphasize what Paul says in verse 6. And in order to organize our study, I want to draw four lessons out of that one verse and then offer some pastoral application in terms of why and how we practice church discipline. First of all, notice in verse 6 that discipline within the church is a command of Christ. Paul begins this statement uh, in, a, in a strong way. He says, we command you all, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he uses the same word for command four times in this chapter within the space of just a few verses. The command comes to the church in the name of the Lord, and thus it comes with His authority and power. And it's not to say that if Paul had omitted that phrase, if he had not said, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the instruction would not be binding upon us, but it is a rhetorical way of emphasizing this obligation. It underlines the authority of Jesus that lies behind the command, so that we do not overlook it or discount how important this issue really is. Now, discipline may be practiced for many different reasons in churches today, and oftentimes we find that it's never practiced at all. Uh, discipline can easily and perhaps frequently be abused in churches. It can serve as an instrument for protecting a leader's ego or silencing responsible dissent. It can dismiss those whom the church ought rather to appeal to and seek to restore. On the other hand, most churches, it seems like today, rarely ever discipline erring members. It is a difficult thing, it is uncomfortable and controversial, and especially in a litigious society such as ours, it may even be risky to the church to do so. And it's easier simply to let the immoral or disorderly brother leave without warning him, without making any statement about him or to the churches that he may later join. But discipline within the church is in fact an act of obedience to Christ. And if we would be obedient to Christ, then there must be a place in our faith and practice for this kind of activity. Paul directed the church in Corinth to discipline a brother who was living in an incestuous relationship. And he says later in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, To this end I also wrote that I might put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things. And discipline is that sort of test. It's one of those occasions when a congregation learns whether they will be obedient to Christ in everything, even when it is hard to be obedient. If we truly love one another, then we do not want to have to practice discipline. We do not want to cause harm and, and shame and, and to, to create the, the rupture that discipline inevitably will. But it is love that compels us to practice it. It is love for Christ because our obedience to Him is a proof of our love and devotion. It is love for our erring brother because we love him too much to allow him to go unopposed in a self-destructive pattern of life. And it is love for the church, recognizing that the church is not well cared for when we neglect the proper exercise of discipline. Second, notice in our text today that discipline within the church involves a form of disassociation. When we talk about discipline, we must distinguish two types of discipline that we can see in the Bible. Uh, one we call administrative discipline, and this simply relates to maintaining good order in the visible church. It involves adding and removing, for reasons other than excommunication, persons from the membership of the church. It involves keeping proper records and doing whatever contributes to the health and well-being of the body. Discipline is part of the disciple-making process, and it includes the kind of teaching that we're doing right now. It includes the fellowship that we enjoy within the community of the saints, the fellowship and teaching that strengthens faith and our relationships with one another. It's just like in the case of parenting. If the only time that you instruct your children in what they should do or correct them for their faults is when you have a major uh, event of disobedience, well, in, in that case, you're a terrible parent. 
No, you should be instructing your children all along. You should be gently encouraging and correcting and reproving your children so that you can ideally avoid most cases when uh, a more intense form of discipline would be required. And we would hope that the same would be true within the visible body of Christ. If we faithfully practice the daily administrative sort of discipline that we all need, then it will only be on rare occasions that a more judicial type of discipline will be required. But there is that second type of discipline that we refer to as judicial discipline, which involves reproving and correcting more serious errors. Now sometimes these errors may be due to ignorance. And in those cases, a gentle word of admonition and further instruction is all that will be needed. A person can simply have pointed out to them why this was wrong and and help them understand how better to conduct themselves. Other times, the error may be due to carelessness. And in those cases, a, a firmer reproof and a stronger form of instruction and exhortation may be warranted. But sometimes, the error involved is due to willfulness in the pursuit of wicked and worldly habits. And in these cases, the church must act in a firm and decisive manner for the sake of the brother's soul and for the protection of the church's purity and peace. Judicial discipline does not merely take one form. It should not uh, be exercised in merely one particular style. It's been said before that if the only tool in your toolbox is a hammer, then every problem begins to look like a nail. Well, distinctions have to be made. We have to use wisdom and, and, and love in assessing what is required in each case, both for the glory of God and for the good of all persons involved. In verse 6, Paul commands the brethren to withdraw, the New King James Version says, or to keep away from, the English Standard Version reads, to withdraw or keep away from every brother who walks disorderly. This type of discipline that Paul is speaking of involves a type of shunning. But that needs to be carefully defined and understood because this idea has often been misapplied in very abusive ways. We are not talking about treating a person badly. We are not talking about pretending they do not exist or cutting off all contact with them. In fact, this is the reason I wanted to continue to read the text is because in verses 14 and 15, Paul clarifies exactly what he means. Notice again those verses. He says, if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him that he may be ashamed. Yet, do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. What does this discipline withhold? Not personal contact and communication. No, you can't admonish him as a brother if you refuse to acknowledge that he exists, if you no longer speak to him. No, what what is withheld is spiritual and ecclesiastical communion. We are not to keep company with the disobedient brother who is placed under discipline. In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 that we are not even to eat with such a person. We're not to act as if everything is normal and okay when one of our brethren is determined to pursue a sinful lifestyle that is damaging to his faith and will be destructive to his soul. Now, it may be appropriate to refuse to share a common meal with a person in that condition. He he invites you out for lunch and you say, Brother, uh, I'm really not in a position where we can just enjoy a time of table fellowship over lunch. I'd be glad to get together with you. I'd be glad for us to reason from the Scriptures about your condition. I'd be glad for us to meet together and pray. But I don't feel like I can enjoy just simply lunch as we would on any other day. That may be appropriate and emphasize the fact that as long as his heart is hardened, there will be a rupture in your relationship. But that application to social meals, to social engagement, common meals at the table is only a secondary application because the primary context in all of these passages speaking about discipline in the New Testament is with regard to the spiritual fellowship that we enjoy in the visible body of Christ. The table fellowship that is to be withdrawn is preeminently fellowship at the Lord's table. We are not to eat the Lord's supper with this type of person. That is the company that we are not to keep with him because he remains unrepentant in his sin. And so while there may be a place 
for us to withdraw from other types of social engagement. After all, it's going to weaken the credibility of your warning in his life if you warn him of the danger to his soul that his impenitence poses, and then you simply say, okay, now having said that, let's go hang out and just kind of enjoy ourselves. <laughs> Forget about this, the, the unpleasantness of this conversation. Let's just go and have a good time. Well, that's going to weaken the credibility of your warning. And so good judgment has to be exercised in those cases. But understand that when the scriptures say, don't keep company with him, don't eat with him, it's preeminently talking about the company that we keep as the body of Christ, the eating that we enjoy together at the Lord's table. Third, notice in our text that discipline within the church applies to members of the church. The ecclesiastical context of this discipline is made even clearer by its specific application to brothers in Christ, not unbelievers. We command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother not every neighbor, not every heathen person in your community. No, withdraw from every brother who walks in a disorderly manner. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul explicitly distinguishes the instructions concerning discipline with regard to brethren from the common relationships that we enjoy with unbelievers and non-Christians in the world around us. Paul is not talking about who we eat lunch with in our workplace cafeteria. He's talking about with whom we enjoy fellowship in the body of the Lord and, and with whom we receive the body and blood of the Lord on the Lord's day. Church discipline is not for those outside the church. It is not about boycotting organizations in the community. It is not about judging those whom God will judge on the last day. It is about correcting dangerous and destructive errors within the visible church that jeopardize souls, that contaminate the body's witness, and that undermine integrity within the congregation. And we need to recognize that church discipline is exactly that. It is church discipline. It is corrective action that is taken by the church, as the church, and toward members of the church. The command in our text is addressed to you all. Not to you all individually, but to you all collectively. It is not an individual function. It is not an individual campaign that you are to embark upon. You do not decide who is disciplined. And neither do I, acting as an individual. We do not decide individually who ought to be disciplined within the body of Christ. But rather, as a church, as a church... We exercise discipline as we are led by those rulers, governors, elders that God has called and appointed for the sake of the well-being of the body. Now, that means that when someone is placed under discipline, we are all obligated to honor that discipline unless it is a situation in which you feel a gross error has been made so egregious that you must protest against it then every one of us are obligated to honor that discipline. You may say, but I didn't choose to discipline that person. No, but, but the church did. The church is, and we as the church are part of the exercise of that discipline. And even if a protest must be lodged, there is a proper way to do so in keeping with biblical principles of government and good order, which keeps us focused on Christ and on His Word and not on personalities and the petty kind of complaints that often arise when discipline has to be administered. Some of us have seen the chaos that results from every man doing what is right in his own eyes with regard to discipline. But if each of us individually decides when, whom, how, and why to discipline, it really isn't church discipline any longer. The power of church discipline does not belong to any member of the congregation, nor to the body democratically. It is exercised by the whole church through the officers who are called and equipped to welcome, warn, and when necessary, exclude persons in the name of Christ. And then fourth, in our text, notice that discipline within the church addresses ongoing and serious errors contrary to Christ. Who is it that Paul says to discipline or withdraw from in this case? He says, every brother who is walking disorderly and not according to the tradition. Now, several key features here need to be noted. First, this discipline is impartial. It is applied to every brother 
who walks disorderly. There is to be no favoritism in judgment. The discipline is for the good of all, so everyone must be subject to it. Second, the criteria for discipline relates to a pattern or practice of misconduct. It is not for a mistake. It is not to be applied when there is simply a misunderstanding. It seeks to correct an ongoing situation. Walking. A pattern of life. Now this does not mean that the sin has to be ongoing for a long time before something can be done about it. Discipline might be applied to stop a dangerous habit from developing. It's just as with our children. Uh, parents have to decide when to nip something in the bud and to say, no, you can't, you can't go down that path. We're not going to create this kind of a, a habitual attitude or action. And the leaders of the church must use the same sort of discretion. A mistake that is unlikely to be repeated simply needs to be admonished. But when you see a series of sinful decisions and repeated errors, that needs to be intercepted before a more destructive pattern can emerge. Thirdly, disorderly literally means to be out of ranks. And once again, we see that it's not merely failing to march in step no matter how hard one is trying. No, it refers to someone who is AWOL who is breaking military order, who is rejecting the standards of conduct and failing to live as becomes one devoted to the service of Jesus Christ. No one is to be disciplined in the visible body of Christ because he is trying hard but not succeeding. Because if that were the criteria for discipline, every one of us would be under discipline. Because we are trying hard, but none of us are living up to the standard of God's law. But when a person departs, when a person deserts their duty, when a person determines to live in a way that is contrary to the standards of the kingdom of Christ and does so willfully and impenitently, that soldier is out of ranks. And fourth, notice that the tradition Paul refers to here is the Christian tradition. It is the faith and practice handed down to us from Christ by the apostles. There is a way of life that corresponds to that tradition. We are not free to do as we please or live according to our own standards of morality. The Father has revealed what He expects of the sons and daughters who live in His house, and so long as we live in that house and enjoy the benefits of sonship, we are expected to live in a manner that is in keeping with the Father's rules. And so let me emphasize today, That judicial discipline is not for what we might call the ordinary struggle against sin in the Christian life. If it were, none of us could keep company with each other or even with ourselves. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost, as we say every Lord's Day. So let's be clear on what we're talking about. Walking disorderly and not according to the tradition refers to serious and unrepentant behavior that undermines the credibility of one's profession of faith in Christ. A big part of walking in an orderly manner is acknowledging that I remain a sinner and that I constantly stand in need of repentance and the grace of Christ. And when I deny that, when I deny my ongoing obligation to repentance, when I cherish my sin rather than hating and abhorring it, when I worship the idols of my own lust rather than praying to Christ to tear those idols down, then I am no longer living as a Christian. And the church must act to admonish me with regard to that and to instruct me to do better. Now I want to offer some pastoral application before we close today and reflect on why we practice discipline and how, in this congregation, we do so. First, why do we discipline erring and unrepentant church members? It's certainly not because we enjoy doing it. It's not because we have a vindictive spirit. God knows otherwise. We do it out of love for the erring brother, love for the church, and love for the Lord Jesus Christ who commands us to exercise discipline in these cases. The Scriptures identify several reasons for judicial discipline which can be summarized under three headings. To vindicate the honor of Christ, to promote the purity of His church, and to reclaim the offender. What would it say to the unbelieving world if we did not act to uphold the standards of our faith when our members depart from them? If those who are named as brothers in our community give themselves to drunkenness and debauchery or to sexually immoral conduct, Do we really believe what we say we do if we turn a blind eye to that behavior? 
We preach about morality. We preach about sobriety. We preach about uh, living uh, as Christ, walking as Christ before the eyes of the world. And, and when one of us gives ourselves to another pattern of life, if we, if we say nothing about it, if we do nothing about it, what does it really say to the world? It would say that we are hypocrites. That we do not practice what we preach and we do not really even believe the things that we say. The world may not agree with our ethical standards, but when they see us act to discipline the erring among us, the unrepentant among us, they will know that our commitment is genuine and that it is to Christ. If sin continues unchecked and unrepented of in the congregation, then it will spread to other members just like an infection. Sin contaminates the entire camp and brings the judgment of God upon us all if we choose not to act and to do anything about it. Now, I'm not responsible for the sins that my brother may commit, but I am responsible for how I respond to him and to those sins. You know, discipline is actually a means of grace, even though we don't often think about it in those terms. Discipline is to be exercised because it is for the offender's good, not for his harm. It is to humble and shame him, the Bible says, but in a wholesome way. Not because we regard him as an enemy, but because we love him as a brother. Because we, we, we want to bring him to his senses. The loss of spiritual fellowship should be painful to him. The constant prayers and appeals of his brethren should work upon his conscience to bring him under conviction. The truth is, if we are unwilling to discipline each other when it is necessary and unavoidable, then we don't really love each other at all. The truth is, I don't stop strangers in Walmart and tell them that they need to put on more clothes and buy different kinds of food and stop acting like a loser, even though that's exactly what some of them need to hear. But I don't tell that to strangers in Walmart because they're not part of my family. But my brothers and sisters in the church are. And the truth is, I need accountability from them just as they need accountability from me and from each other. We need correction from those that love us and those that are courageous enough to speak truth into our lives because I can't see all of my errors. And sometimes my brethren in the church will be able to see errors that I cannot see. And I need their help in discovering those things so that I might repent of them. Well, how do we discipline erring and unrepentant church members. The truth is, we only do so when there is no other choice. To do otherwise would be to disobey God. The Bible does not say that we begin with judicial discipline. But when it is necessary, then we must be faithful in applying it. Some of you know that there have been moments in your own lives when you might have easily come under church discipline. But instead, we talked about it. You met with me or one of the other elders. We reasoned together. We prayed together. God was gracious. And there never was any need for discipline in that case. Praise God. We wish that every situation worked out that way. The church does not know and should not ever know every time there is a problem with a member that involves some conflict or some private sin or some concern that an individual has as we, said other, uh, uh, as we said earlier, if we are faithful in the other ordinary daily form of discipline, then we will not need judicial discipline nearly as often. But there will be times when a person refuses to repent. There will be times when a person is engaged in gross error and their repentance is uncertain. There will be times when the heinousness of the offense or its public nature requires something more formal to be said or done. And in those cases, our book of church order outlines five levels of censure based upon principles that we find in the Bible. These censures are the judgments that may be applied when someone comes as his own accuser and confesses his sin to the elders or is found guilty after an investigation is made into the allegations and a trial is held in the court of the church. Let me read to you from one portion of our book of church order. The book of discipline, chapter 6, section B, outlines these various levels of censure. And again, these are simply a a summary of the principles and practices that we believe we see Scripture leading us to do. The first level is admonition. Admonition consists in tenderly and solemnly confronting the offender with his sin, warning him of his danger, and exhorting him to repentance and to greater fidelity to the Lord Jesus Christ. The second is rebuke. 
Rebuke is a form of censure more severe than admonition. It consists in setting forth the serious character of the offense, reproving the offender, and exhorting him to repentance and to more perfect fidelity to the Lord Jesus Christ. The third level would be suspension. Suspension is a form of censure by which one is deprived of the privileges of membership in the church, of office, or of both. It may be for a definite or an indefinite time. Suspension of an officer from the privileges of membership shall always be accompanied by suspension from office, but the latter does not necessarily involve the former. The fourth level is deposition. Deposition is a form of censure more severe than suspension. It consists in a solemn declaration by the trial judicatory that the offender is no longer an officer in the church. And the fifth level is excommunication. Excommunication is the most severe form of censure and is resorted to only in cases of offenses aggravated by personal persistent impenitence. It consists in a solemn declaration by an ecclesiastical judicatory that the offender is no longer considered a member of the body of Christ. And if you're wondering what a judicatory is, that is simply the term for the court of the church. The, the, in this case, the session of the local church has jurisdiction over its members, or the presbytery over the regional church has jurisdiction over the members of that body. In the case of serious and unrepentant sin, a person will usually be suspended from the privilege of receiving the Lord's Supper and from being able to vote in congregational meetings until the elders are confident of that person's repentance. And if after a period of time and continued prayer and appeals, the sinner remains hardened in his sin and is unwilling to repent and return to the Lord Jesus, then the suspension of church privileges, of membership privileges, may be increased to excommunication. Well, church discipline is not something that I enjoy preaching on. As a matter of fact, it wasn't what I wanted to preach on this week, and I never uh, enjoy doing so. But I would rather preach on it for a hundred Lord's Days in a row than ever have to apply it again. But let me close by pointing out that if we become fearful of exercising church discipline, or we begin to dread the hard duty that Christ calls us to, then in time, our courage and our commitment to fidelity in this matter will begin to wane. We need to be reminded of the importance of loving biblical discipline for the health of the body, the glory of Christ, and the spiritual welfare of our brethren. May God give us wisdom, strength, and courage to apply these principles in a godly and effective way. Amen. Let's bow together. Our God and Father in heaven, this is a matter that we do not like having to discuss, and yet your word teaches us how we ought to think and what we ought to do in these cases. And we do pray, O Lord, for wisdom. We do pray, O Lord, for courage. We do pray, O Lord, for the faith to be faithful to the duty of applying discipline when and where it is needed. We pray, O Lord, for those whom this church has disciplined, those who are under censure even now, and for those who in past years have been excommunicated from the body. We pray, O Lord, that you would be gracious in these cases to bring sinners under conviction and to repentance, that you would grant unto them a true and abiding faith, that where that faith has failed, that you would renew it, where faith never has been, O Lord, that you would grant it, and that you would help us, O Lord, to pray earnestly for those who are under censure. O God, we pray that we would appeal to our brethren to repent and trust in Christ, and that we ourselves, fearing for our own souls, might attend carefully to that discipline that is applied, and renew our repentance and obedience toward God as we are helped and indwelt by your Holy Spirit. Have mercy upon us, O Lord. Bless us and keep us through faith and the promises of the gospel for the eternal life to which you have called us. In Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we do pray. Amen.